again in Viacom's studio. It's a simulation of my studio at home, so it's my studio away from home. Uh, tonight I'm going to be doing a floral study and of course assuming that the viewers who are watching this do in fact draw some. This is not entirely for beginners. Uh, I've set up my still life here, my floral rather, and I've uh, begun to paint on the background because backgrounds are where you start after you have drawn it. I think that when, as soon as when, the, um, when you see what I have done here, you will understand that because um, I'm working from life, it is essential that I have, the, um, that I have it in front of me. So laying out, laying out a still life means the placement of the items. And uh, I'm going to reset this a little bit so that it's not quite so slanted. And you'll be able to see that uh, working from life, the, the, the background should be kept, especially in a floral, the background should be kept absolutely as simple as possible uh, for the beginning. When you become a little bit more adept at interiors and at backgrounds, then we can maybe start to deal and tackle the problem of uh, what is behind the floral. But a floral is such an extraordinarily complex arrangement between the flowers and the greens and the light on the flowers and the quality of the petals that the background should be simply, as uh, the painter says, thrown away. Uh, on the walls here in my, uh, in my television studio, there, are, there is a study of a flower painting in which the background has been almost totally ignored. So that's what I'm going to start out by telling you right now, to ignore the backgrounds and get right to work on the flowers. I have put that in because of color relationships. The background has got to be indicated somehow to know how far to go with the brilliance of the colors of the flowers. So as you can see, I've simply uh, begun to um, uh, sketch in very, um, very roughly the background colors after having placed the, the uh, flowers in their particular uh, position. The, um, and the greens are important, but they're not as important as the, as the blooms themselves. Pansies are very cooperative. Uh, they uh, pose very nicely. They last a good long time. They do not fade as quickly nor open as quickly as many other flowers, such as roses and iris. And um, tulips, uh, those are the tulips are very um, ambitious flowers and they want to uh, open very quickly. As soon as they find a nice warm place, they will open and uh, not close again until evening. But here is, as you might say, just the very beginning of, of a floral study. Uh, I have in my hand sable brushes, red sable brushes, which are to be kept clean at all times with a nice uh, clean jar of um, turpentine. And every time you dip into a new color, you rinse your brush. It is very much the same as if you are in fact working in the kitchen, you do not cut. Um, a peach with a knife that has touched an onion. We all know that. And so painting can be related in that way in a rather simplified form that uh, means that you will keep a very clean, a clean pad. Then this may look messy to you, but to me it's absolutely pristine and clean and wonderful and ready to go. It's got the colors arranged in a fairly organized manner. The oranges and the reds uh, are, are grouped together going into the purples and then the blues. And then we can stop that and go into the uh, tones of siennas and darker colors. And up here the oranges turn into another bur uh, raw sienna and going into thing. And I keep the whites and the yellows far apart from everything else because they are very vulnerable to being tinted with other tones. So as you can see, I'm ready to start with this great big wonderful uh, uh, palette, which I have cleaned off for the occasion. And by the time the painting is over, it will probably be totally covered with paint. The middle part is called the field, which is where you mix. 
at least for this kind of painting. There will be other times when I'm going to be mixing right on the canvas, but for the moment, this is where you mix. I'm going to start with the most pale of all, namely the um, the pink, oh, the pink, the, the yellow, the yellow pansy. Uh, that uh, this is casting a rather unfortunate shadow. I think I'm going to simply raise this and not. Well, I'm going to put it. I'm going to put it forward. Hold on for just a second while I put this forward, and so that that shadow does not worry me in the painting of this pansy. Painting flowers has to be done in an enormous hurry because they do fade. You can't take weeks to paint a flower. You've got to do it as quickly as possible. So my advice, of course, is turn off the t telephone, don't eat lunch, uh, don't let the um, don't let distractions come in because. To do a pan, I'm going to attempt to do this study in uh, the, just the period of the show, which is going to be the neatest trick of the week, I'm sure. But you'll get the idea, if I don't finish the painting, you will be able to understand the uh, manner in which you go about doing flower pictures. A lot of people are intimidated by flower pictures because they say they're too complicated, they are, uh, they're confusing, and let me show you just how you, were, how you approach this. Now, the toning down of yellow is done with sienna. And all flowers, whether you think it or not, have shadows. The little petals turn and they become, uh, they become little units unto themselves that cast their own shadows. One petal will cast a shadow on this one, such as here. Then uh, maybe, maybe there is less possibility of uh, shadows on this, these petals because they are facing the outside. They're facing the light, rather. I'm going to get into the, into the darker tones of the uh, middle of this particular pansy, and it is so dark that it appears to be almost black. But the delicacy with which this darkness comes is done with a, th with a smaller brush and the tip of the brush, and done in a nice interpretive manner. And the reason that you put the yellow on first is obviously that these wonderful spiky things are going to be coming out from the center and be, and be overlapping on the dark. The uh, characteristic of a pansy is, of course, these uh, very, uh, well, they're spiky. And you think that anything as soft and delicate as a pansy isn't going to have something as harsh and spiky as the center. But that's probably the fascination of the pansy, that there are these so-called uh, lethal pointy designs to them, which belie the fact that they are gentle and very shy little flowers that come only in the spring. Uh, and then after that, unless you're uh, unless you've got a greenhouse or a real genius for growing plants all summer long, the pansies will pretty much uh, go and mind their own business come come the later on in the summer. I'm rinsing my brush and making sure that I've got uh, plenty of uh, paper toweling in front of me so that I can keep it clean because, as I said to you before, Keeping the brushes clean is the trick of keeping brilliant paintings. Uh, it, it takes almost no effort to turn a painting into mud by having the oil colors blend into one another. As you can see, there is a highlight on this particular petal, and then inside, where the flower has this lovely uh, meeting of three petals, comes the interior, and then just a touch of the um, of the orange comes in this little lip here, which is identifiable as a pansy's uh, characteristic. The shadow underneath here is a little bit more intense than what I put in, so I'll darken it. And as you can see, that makes the petal above uh, come forward. As soon as you deal with the shadow, you've got the petal up above uh, protruding and causing that shadow. Well. Uh, if, you can, if you can dismiss a flower that quickly, then we can go into the one that is slightly underneath it, and it's in shadow, and therefore almost in total silhouette. So this large, um, this large one in the foreground has cast a shadow enough to make the one underneath it uh, completely, uh, almost completely in silhouette, which makes for the interest of the painting. Uh, there are a few patterns of this dark, wonderful, uh, V um, deep, deep mauve uh, pattern in the center of this. Um, there it is. It's, un it, it's, it's underneath the other flower and turning very dark. So uh, those are things to pay attention to, even though they don't seem important. That flower is, is virtually a part of the background, but it's very important to get that. The only greens that I have on my palette are sap green. That's the name of a color. and. Um, 
you uh, are the mixing of greens is a dangerous piece of work when you're dealing with flower painting because the greens can be really very very unfortunate I do not believe in buying greens in tubes I believe in mixing greens with blues and blacks and yellows and oranges and siennas and so on and avoiding purchasing any of the colors that are uh, called greens of any kind and hence I um, will only rely upon sap green which is probably the only one to really purchase. As far as colors are concerned there have been other programs that have shown uh, the use of only a few colors and that is um, uh, not the way I operate. As you can see I have a rather full palette of color which is essential, especially in flower paintings. In landscape paintings, it's less essential, but in flower paintings, naturally, the color wheel is uh, represented everywhere. Uh, I have a nice sort of little um, uh, fanciful leaf coming out here with a characteristically scalloped leaf that the pansies have. And they have to, that, that kind of detail has to be paid attention to because you can't put a strange leaf on a pansy, otherwise it just doesn't turn out to be a pansy anymore. The green is almost as important as the flower itself. And they have lovely uh, little, well, scalloped leaves. And then they come out on fine uh, stems because they are in fact uh, very, I've, I've enlarged, by the way, I've enlarged this pansy study for the visibility. To work on, on a very small uh, floral study uh, would be pointless because it would be too much lost. But as you can see, the leaves are done in a very free manner and they're interpreted more than they are painted. Uh, because flower pictures should be uh, very spontaneous, just as flowers are. So um, I'm going to go from that one to, to deal with the, um, the white one at the bottom. I must prepare the background of the white one at the bottom because it's full of dark leaves behind it, which is going to enable me to get that white flower uh, with plenty of contrast to be able to see where it begins and ends. Even though my background is grayish, I've got to uh, provide for a nice um, understandable background for the painting of this uh, predominantly white pansy that has got uh, lovely other colors involved with it, namely a r another really deep purple. Now I have to wash the brush very carefully here because I'm going to be going right into white and I'm going to use a clean brush for that. White being very tricky, it picks up just about everything. So here we have the introduction of the white of the white pansy and it's uh, other, uh, now the pansies of different, uh, most pansies are composed of five petals. In case you are questioning that, um, find a pansy and count the petals. That is essential to the anatomy of, fl of a flower, to find out just exactly how many petals there are in this particular flower. Pansies, I guarantee you, for the most part, have five petals. The one in the background is as important as the one in the foreground. Now, the way I'm going to tackle the, um, the outline of the next petal is by doing exactly what the flower tells me to do. It is telling me that it has got a, a border of pale a mauve in it and a pale mauve border in this one as well. Now we, you can begin to see that this particular pansy is emerging. Now the rest of this flower is this incredible, dark, vibrant, purple center. And in it goes, uh, without any hesitation whatsoever. And um, the characteristic of this remarkable one, and they are breeding some pretty amazing looking pansies these days, that are sometimes almost all these deep colors of purple. I think I better introduce a little bit more red in that to get it really purple and uh, uh, rely on the fact that the purple is so dark that it looks almost black at this point. And it has these very lethal, wonderful spikes coming out of it. As you can see, the characteristic of this particular pansy is beginning to emerge. It certainly is not any other flower 
but a pansy. And that's why I chose these. I was going to uh, uh, do a rose, but uh, they are so complex that I must deal with that in different stages. I'm going to be breaking just a little, uh, just a moment or two, but I do want to finish talking about this particular pansy and, in, and, and go, go back to my white brush because I've kept that separate and tell you that in order to finish this one in, then you must understand that this is, of course, a very, very sketchy way of approaching this. I do not expect people who are just beginning to paint to be able to, to uh, do a pansy uh, in, in this amount of time. So this is rather quickly and rather roughly done. But if you can get this far in the beginning, then the details can come along uh, later and the more complex study of a pansy or any flower can be done after the general attitude towards, flower, towards flowers is understood. That the attitude has to be quickly done because of the, uh, the short lifespan of a cut flower. And cut flowers are what people usually rely upon when they're painting flowers. Um, they are available all during the year in the flower, flower shop, so there is really no need anymore to wait for these flowers to get into bloom. In a few moments, I'll come back and deal with the rest of this painting and so, uh, hang on. Uh, set up here. Uh, so since uh, w when I left uh, I, and have come back, I took a moment to do some more of the greenery uh, because it is merely a repetition of what I showed you before. It's a question of being observant, looking at the subject matter, seeing, seeing where they are placed, and picking up the essential elements of the greenery. And so there was it would have been pointless for you to sit in on all of that because we do have such a, a limited period of time. Now I'm ready to be able to and deal with these next two. This one has faded since we've uh, come into the studio and I'm going to swipe this one and put it over here. The composition won't mind, the eventual viewer will not mind that I have had to substitute this flower which has in since, since faded and all curled up and gotten uh, unfortunate. Uh, and so I will simply do that and that's what is called the composition of a picture. It is the creative part, the creative part of painting. Uh, to be so literal as to say that I become because my flower died, I must paint it dead, is the point that I'm trying to make here. So I'll get to that one, but here's a lovely, delicious looking piece down here, which I'm going to use a clean brush for because it's got some wonderful, pure, clean colors on it. And as I said before, the Im Im most important thing, so here's a clean brush. It has no paint on it, as you can see. I'm demonstrating to you that I have no color on this whatsoever. And I'm going to dip into the white and produce, I'm going to put it right on the canvas here, uh, because I told you before, we do sometimes, I do sometimes mix on the canvas and this is producing a really delicious pinkish mauve. I'm using geranium lake, that's the name of the color, and available, the Grumbacher people put it out, and um, for flower painting there is no question that the colors must be pure and must be clean, otherwise you do not get the luminescence of a, of a flower. Uh, here, uh, when we go, when you see the the flower in person, you will notice that uh, it may be a little bit 
a little bit more vibrant at the edges here. That's why I'm going to add it as I go. They are, see there, see that's an extraordinary color. It's almost like trying to paint sunshine. Um, to get as close as possible is the best thing that anyone can hope for. To, um, to really come as close as you can. And therefore, when you see that there is a blend, such as that in the middle there, that one over there, uh, when you blend it in the middle, that's what is going to give the translucency to this flower, to make sure that you observe. Learn to see. There is the problem. It is never a problem to put paint on canvas. I, I think that if you put um, a brush in the hands of a, of a uh, well-behaved chimp, uh, it can paint. The problem is to learn how to see. And so uh, one, of my, one of my things is uh, through all of these programs is to be observant. To, 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 if you live in this world, you might just as well look at it and see what you've got going for you and what the world has to offer. And many, many times I find that uh, observation uh, is not as carefully done as it should. So here I am to try to open the doors of close observation. Namely, one of the more minuscule observations is that the edges of this particular pansy are darker purplish rose and the center becomes pale uh, and yellowish and oh absolutely without question the most delicious looking flower you can imagine so i've got i wipe my brush every time i i go into another color uh, and there's no need for me to wipe my brush in front of you all the time you know you know that that's the way i can manage to keep these colors clear uh, a lot of people speak to me about flower painting and say, I make a mess. It becomes so impossible, and I, then I, I, but the mess is caused by the fact that keeping the brush clean at all times with a, a cloth is the essential part. It's the trick. It is, they say, how do you do it? Well, the trick is to keep your brush clean. The rest of it sort of falls in. Now we're getting into a petal that's nearer to me. And I've prepared the background with that pale color that comes from the center. And I'm working toward the darkness of these front petals. Now, the lightness of the, 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 the luminescence of this flower is achieved by putting this pale color here and then all of a sudden uh, giving you the uh, intense darkness of the petal in the front. The deduction is another uh, important element to the painting of flowers. If you have deduced <laughs> that the pale, uh, the pale part of the petal is visible because the dark is in front of it, then you've got the battle won. You've got it almost all solved and won. The really dark color that is coming here is going to be, I'm going to overlap it into this vase because I put the earth tone of the um, of the bottom part of this thing in too soon, and I want the I want the uh, pansy to be a little bit more full and a little bit more visible. So I'm going to very um, arbitrarily, not arbitrarily, but very purposefully uh, uh, bring this pansy farther down towards the vase, um, towards the vase's edge. There are some slight indications of this wonderful pale pink at the edge of this, um, of this pansy, which is going to show you uh, where it ends. And as you can see, that slight uh, swipe of color in there uh, denotes the end of that pansy against the darkness of the, um, of the earth. In here uh, are the little, is the little, uh, I've, I don't quite know the name, I should know the botanical name of what that little arrangement is in the center here, but it's very characteristic of a pansy, should never be missed, uh, and the, uh, the yellow part is called the beard. This yellow part is called the beard, and the little side ones there that form that dark triangle in the middle must have another name which I'm not familiar with and I'm hoping a botanist is watching and maybe can give me that information. So we have here the uh, essential um, general characteristics of this particular pansy. I can go on to the upper one. I, I, I must put another indication of a back petal here because there is another back petal. And that is done, that can be done in the context of reworking a picture. When you rework a picture, you go back and you make corrections of where you, where you failed. So we've got one, two, three, that's not bad as a trial. Now let's play with this, this fake one. 
I'm going to do uh, one that is um, that I'm swiping from here, but I'm going to uh, be rather uh, well. It isn't cheating; it's composing. A lot of people say, "Well, that's cheating." Well, it isn't because if my flower hadn't died, I wouldn't be compelled to do this. But I'm going to show you that with just the slight addition of orange. Uh, in my pale, pale yellow and white, I'm going to produce a perfectly uh, acceptable uh, pansy uh, it, it, just in another color. We know that they come, at least I know because I'm familiar with these flowers, I paint them all the time, that you can in fact find them this tone. It is for a variety and for an illustration in point of what I'm talking about that you can in fact compose as you go along. So we have here the uh, self-same flower that I have over there that was kind enough to not die and I'm merely uh, giving it a different, slightly different tone. Uh, here is the shadow that you will see that, you, that I have in the other one. Uh, the shadow that's being cast by the fact that this petal turns. Too dark. Let's uh, r r clean, the, clean the brush and uh, take the dark out and start again. The um, business of starting again is another a case in point that people say I don't know how to handle my mistakes. Well it's very much like mistakes in life just start over. Wipe out the mistake and start over and so we have here as you can see a totally invented color pansy but with a model over on the side. Uh, done all the time. If anybody thinks that uh, the flower paintings are exactly what you see them, they aren't. They are done in stages. The flowers die and then you set up the next day with fresh ones. Uh, it's a good thing to know because people say I could never paint that fast and the flowers die too fast. I've got to fix dinner, I've got to go to the store, I've got to go to the city and whatever. And I can't keep doing it. Well, you can set your painting up again at another time with fresh ones. This has a little division in the pattern in the center. Right there, this little division here, characteristic, observe. Learn to see. This is going to be repeated just about every time I sit in front of this easel and talk to you about painting, and that is see. Just watch, just look at what you're seeing and observe. That's the trick about painting. Time is beginning to, uh, is to run out. Uh, this is a flower study done probably much too quickly for the, um, for the fairness of it. Uh, I have a sister who would say, that's not fair, you're telling everybody they can do that in a short period of time. But what I have done is to give you the elements and the essentials. If you really have questions that bug you to death about what I have done, write to me. Care of Viacom, I will be glad to answer your mail uh, as soon as possible. And in the meantime, I hope that you've enjoyed what I've done. I hope you've learned something. The advice, of course, is once again the lecture. Keep your brushes clean. Make sure that you work from life. Copying a photograph or, a, or a somebody else's drawing can get you into trouble. So um, besides that, you can enjoy the flowers uh, later. So thanks for watching, and do tune in the next time that the Cable Easel is announced on this station. Goodbye.